Good morning. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Roderick Jenkins, and I'm a program officer with the New York Community Trust and, the co and one of the co-founders of the New York Juvenile Justice Initiative. This morning, I I'm representing the group of foundations and individuals that make up the New York Juvenile Justice Initiative. Uh, we formed this affinity group of foundations a few years ago to improve New York's juvenile justice system and outcomes for justice-involved youth. Today, we are pleased to co-sponsor this event with the Child, Welf with, uh, Child Welfare Watch and the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. For several years now, philanthropy has worked hand in hand with government leaders to press for systemic reforms of New York's juvenile justice system. All of us believe that it will take, take more partnerships of government, philanthropy, the business community, and communities themselves for us to get justice-involved youth headed in the right direction. That's it. That's all I have to say. Uh, now I'll turn things over to Andrew White. Thank you, Roderick. Is this working? Okay. We have a new po podium. It makes everybody look shorter, <laughs> especially me. Not Roderick. <laughs> that doesn't work. Um, so welcome to the new school. I'm glad you could all make it. And welcome to the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy, of which the center is a part. I'm Andrew White, and I direct the center. Um, center for New York City Affairs is an applied Center for New York City Affairs is an applied policy research institute that drives innovation in social policy. We seek to improve the effectiveness of government and other organizations in their work with low-income urban communities in New York City. And we're home to the Child Welfare Watch Project, which publishes reports on critical issues in child and family policy, including the edition that I hope you picked up on the way in the door. We also publish news briefs and other information on the Child Welfare Watch blog, which you can get to through the center's website at centernyc.org. And you can follow us on Twitter, at Child Welfare NYC. And we're streaming this event, and it'll be archived. So if you want to go back and make sure you heard what people said, you can do that. Um, the Child Welfare Watch project is made possible thanks to grants from the IRA W. DeCamp Foundation, the Child Welfare Fund, the Pinkerton Foundation, and the Viola W. Bernard Foundation. Today's program and our newest report on the city's juvenile justice reforms were also supported by the Prospect Hill Foundation. So I want to thank all of those funders, and I want to thank other supporters of the center's work. Um, and those of you, uh, the, the Child Welfare Watch Advisory Board members who are here, um, I also want to thank for all their work. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes when we get to some of the recommendations that the report includes. So here's how this morning's program will unfold. I'm going to speak for a few minutes about our latest report. And then we'll have short comments from Probation Commissioner Vincent Schiraldi and Children's Services Commissioner Ron Richter. And then after they each speak, we'll bring the panel up. And um, later in the session, we'll have time for questions and, and for you all to chime in. Um, <clears throat> so we're now in the 11th and final year of the Bloomberg administration. Almost every day now we're hearing from mayoral candidates about that, how they hope to do things differently starting January 1st, 2014. Issues like juvenile justice are unlikely to get much attention during the campaign, but schools and child care and after school programs have all made their way into the conversation, as have of course policing and crime. And all of these are interrelated. So our conversation today is in the context of this transitional year. And we're here to talk about the transformation of the city's juvenile justice system that's gathered a lot of momentum in the last couple of years. What are the threads of change that this sector wants to see carried forward into the next administration? And how does this system intersect with other things that government does to provide services for families? You know, education, public housing, Preventive child welfare services, mental health care, foster care, youth services, substance abuse treatment, after school programs, job training, all of these things are intertwined with each other. Some of the city's recent work in juvenile justice and child welfare intentionally brings these various human services together, close to the streets and in people's homes and in the neighborhoods. And in our reporting on the late, in the late, 
in our reporting for the latest issue of The Watch, we saw how the probation department's neon neighborhood centers, which link young people on probation to mentoring and training programs and education, work close to home. And we looked at small grassroots programs that are part of the probation department's neighborhood-based response to juvenile delinquency, which are diverting a growing number of children away from the justice system after they've been arrested but before they go to court. As we'll hear, the close to home program at ACS is truly underway now, with more than 200 young people placed in city-run residential programs by order of the court, rather than going upstate. In this Child Welfare Watch, we look at the progress of these reforms, and part of our report looks at the front door of the system, the NYPD, and its role in the lives particularly of public housing residents, and especially the young people who live there. And we also look at the state's efforts to raise the age technically not, but efforts to accommodate 16 and 17 year olds not as adults in the courts, but as teenagers, some, not as they're treated today. And we spell out the cost to young people and to the city and to the state of the continuing process of treating 16 and 17 year olds as adults in criminal court. We also look at some of the changes underway in foster care prevention with evidence-based therapies that have been adapted from the juvenile justice field into child welfare. And there's a lot more in the report. If you look at it, you can see we spent a lot of time on it, probably too much time on it. And um, Abigail Kramer and Kendra Hurley can testify to the immense amount of work that goes into this, so I want to thank them for all of that. So among the key points, first, the number of arrested teens age 15 and under whose cases have been adjusted from court and closed by the probation department increased 47% between 2009 and last year. That's almost by half. So this number of adjustments has doubled since 2008. <clears throat> it's a change that went hand in hand with the city providing funding to neighborhood programs to work with many of these kids. This means that the city is beginning to act more like the suburbs in the way it treats young people who, who get pulled into the justice system. Outside of New York City, almost half of all arrests of young people 15 and under are adjusted and their cases are closed. In the city, we're now up to 37%. So we're not quite there, but we're getting closer. Meanwhile, police continue to stop and arrest young people at a rapid pace. Not just on the streets, but in the schools. Yet the use of juvenile detention fell nearly 20% between 2008 and 2012. It's still higher than many people in this room would like Last year, more than 4,400 boys and girls were admitted to juvenile detention, where they spent an average of 27 days. But the culture of detention and placement is clearly shifting. The number of young people sent by the city's family court judges to juvenile placement, sentenced to spend time in a lockup or on a nonprofit residential campus, has continued to fall year after year. Commissioner Richter began to, big, to drive big changes in juvenile justice when he was at the mayor's office several years ago. Commissioner Shoraldi has been doing this work for most of his career, and Gladys Carrion at the state level has been pressing forward since her appointment at OCFS in 2007. But government officials are only part of this equation when it comes to policy change, <clears throat> at least if they're gonna succeed and persist once they're out of office. So the staff of community-run programs make policies real and neighborhood residents do this as well, including young people and their families, and including perpetrators of crime and their victims. And the caseworkers of nonprofit social service organizations like Boys Town and Children's Village and Good Shepherd Services, and the advocates who push these changes forward to legislators and the mayor and the governor, they're all key. None of this happens unless all these pieces are in place. <clears throat> Last week, we ran an event in this room about uh, the New York City Housing Authority and public housing in the response to the Hurricane Sandy. Um, and one of the big takeaways from that discussion was how the most resilient neighborhoods after the storm were those with strong networks of people and organizations and families who could keep an eye out for each other, which isn't true in every neighborhood in New York. And taking part in that discussion, I was keenly aware that juvenile justice, that in this field there's this really very intentional, a a distinct effort to make those networks happen, to make them real in neighborhoods, to sort of build that community infrastructure for families and children. 
Juvenile arrests and delinquency and child abuse and neglect are these slow, continuous crises, unlike the hurricane. And they unfold over time, and they make an equally radical difference in people's lives. So building up the community's infrastructure and the social networks is obviously important. Still, that's just part of the project. Giving real power to communities is something else, and we're going to talk a bit about that today. That hasn't exactly been a hallmark of the Bloomberg era, whether we're talking about the public education system or policing or even the mayor's own difficult relationships with legislators. And yet there are these great exceptions, there are these seeds of something larger that could still develop around close to home and other programs in ACS and probation and a few other agencies. Our Child Welfare Watch Advisory Board laid out a number of recommendations in the report, they're on pages three and four, and now that it's budget season at City Hall, I just want to point to the last one on page four. If the city doesn't do it, everything it can to shore up the basic community infrastructure, that is the schools, childcare, after school programs, and other basic services, then all of these short term interventions, all the evidence based services and close to home, won't get the results people want over the long haul. In many ways, New York City is a rich place, but it's also a city where hundreds of thousands of working parents live in very real poverty, and they get by on very low wages thanks to food stamps and the earned income tax credit and subsidized child care and after school programs. So the reality is in this service economy, it's simply not designed for people to get by without these things at this point. So that's the context for this conversation. And it's a big context, but that's the point. I guess all of this stuff is connected. Um, I want to start by introducing Commissioner Vincent Chiraldi. He uh, has been Commissioner of the Department of Probation now since for, for almost three years, or exactly three years, uh, bringing 30 years of experience working with troubled youth and juvenile justice systems to New York City. Previous to coming to New York, he was working in Washington, D.C. as Director of the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, but that's only one of a long list that you can look at on the bio sheet. <coughs> Commissioner. Hello, everybody. I don't really like speaking at things where uh, the first speaker talks about the time when us bureaucrats are having other jobs, so I'm going to make a note of not, not having that in my introduction in the future. Um, I want to thank the uh, Center for New York City Affairs and the New York Juvenile Justice Funders Initiative and certainly my fellow panelists uh, for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Um, you're going to hear soon from Commissioner Richter a lot about close to home uh, and from our other panelists, so I'm not going to focus too many of my remarks on it. I'm actually going to talk more about the stuff we do with young adults uh, in New York City. Um, and I'm going to circle back to our efforts to expand alternatives to placement uh, and create a more objective decision-making process for juveniles. But really, most of what I'm going to talk about is the NEON and the Young Men's Initiative work that we do for our, uh, for our young people who are between the ages of 16 and 24, which is about a third of the 24,000 people that are on probation. So we do have a, a sort of disproportionately young client population, uh, but they're not strictly speaking juveniles, at least not uh, under New York law. So I'm going to go back a bit to February 2010 when I first started. And one of the first things I did was I uh, did a listening tour, about 20 focus groups with my staff, with people who were on probation, and then did a bunch of individual meetings with prosecutors and defense attorneys and judges. Uh, um, and, and one of the things, I heard a lot of stuff, but one of the things I heard, particularly from my staff, and, and to some degree from the judges too, is that the agency itself had become overly fixated on, on compliance. Uh, my staff actually fairly spat the word out during uh, their um, uh, focus groups. And by compliance, uh, by compliance, what they meant was uh, both. The client's compulsory compliance with conditions that might or might not have anything to do with better outcomes. Uh, but their staff sort of forced compliance with a very centralized bureaucracy driven rules that didn't make a lot of sense to them. So like a good bureaucrat, after I did all of those, we did a strategic plan. We came up with five uh, strategic goals, which were safer communities, expanding opportunities, resources, and services, promoting organizational excellence, creating strong partnerships and community engagement, and measuring success. But what I always boil those down to is do, more, uh, do less harm, 
do more good, and do it in the community. So most of what we want to talk today about is doing it in the community, but I can't resist the other two a little bit first. So I'm going to talk a little bit about them first. Um, once, I, once I did these focus groups and took a look at the numbers, I, I became determined that um, to make sure that uh, the department was focusing on helping and supervising those people who really needed the help the most, but almost as importantly, leaving those people alone who are best served by having the system touch them very lightly. So a couple ways we're doing that. Um, we've substantially reduced violations of probation. We've substantially, substantially increased early discharges. You heard about our juvenile adjustments, which diverts kids completely out the front end of the system. As you said, it's almost twice what it used to be. And there's a bunch of barriers we're trying to bust down, cleaning up rap sheets, and we're doing that with the Young Men's Initiative and Homeless Services and Department of Correction, uh, vacating ancient warrants. We have thousands of warrants over uh, 10 years old that people have because they stopped seeing their probation officers, helping clients get IDs, banning the box, and that's in, in uh, uh, collaboration with City Hall uh, by basically saying, uh, putting off when we and our contractors inquire about criminal records during employment interviews, and then helping clients get certificates of relief from disability. So like I said, we got about 24,000 clients, uh, and about a third are between the ages of 16 and 24. Just a couple quick indicators on, on uh, doing less harm. Between 2009 and 2011, there was a five-fold increase in requests by the department for early discharges. and the judges actually granted early discharge four times as frequently. The cool thing about this is it's a great uh, incentive to offer, particularly to young clients, right? You think of you're 19 years old and you got five years of probation, it seems like forever, right? You can't remember five years backwards. So five years forward seems like eternity. Um, and only 3% of the people getting discharged early uh, were rearrested for a felony within a year of release. So it's not a jailbreak. Um, uh, uh, then on the other end, you know, in terms of revocation, we pushed staff to go the extra mile to use graduated sanctions, and we were able to cut violations in half between 2010 and 2012. Uh, now, our revocation rates are third. We revoke clients at a third the rate of the rest of the counties in the state. The rest of the counties are 19 percent, we're 6 percent, uh, and probation completion rates are the highest in New York City as they are anywhere in the state. 80 percent of people complete probation successfully. Uh, successfully meaning they don't fail off of it. They're not, you know, they're not going to babysit my daughter after they're done necessarily all of them, or some of them could, but 80% but of them make it through probation to the end, whereas that only happens 65% in the rest of the state. Uh, as we talked about for juvenile clients, we're increasing adjustments, and we just got a grant from the state last year uh, that we think will help us uh, provide even more services to uh, increase adjustments going forward. 90% of the kids uh, successfully complete their adjustment period. So again, it's not a jailbreak. So that's doing less harm. Some are doing less harm. Doing more good, really the big push on doing more good for us is having a whole agency adopt evidence-based policies and practices. That means doing better assessments, uh, focusing on the high and highest risk clients. We're gonna be cutting caseloads in half for the highest risk clients this year then objectively matching the needs of the clients with the kinds of programs that are available through many of you all uh, so that we can actually address the most important needs that the clients have. And, and trying to change our sort of customer service orientation so that when you come into our offices, you're coming into a place that feels professional and treats you like a decent human being, uh, which has not always been the case. Uh, and then finally is the part that I'm, I'm sure most people want to hear the most about, which is doing it in the community. Uh, so I'm going to talk about our, two of our signature initiatives. One is close to home that we share with ACS, and the other is the opening of the neighborhood opportunity networks. Both are really important parts of the mayor's young men's initiative. So when probation was invented back in the 1800s by a Boston shoemaker, John Augustus, it was a totally community-based activity, totally paraprofessional. As time wore on, especially during the 80s and 90s, um, when the war on crime was sort of in full flourish. Uh, probation became much more professionalized, much more detached, much more centralized bureaucracy, and, and in so doing became a major feeder unit into prisons and drail, jails, drifting, I would say even sometimes lurching towards a more punitive correctional approach. The goal of the NEONS is to return us to our roots by involving neighborhood folks and community-based organizations and the assets they all bring with them in our efforts to turn around uh, the lives of our clients 
which are, by the way, their neighbors. We're doing this a couple of ways. One is by physically moving out of what are pretty dingy and depressing downtown centralized offices into the neighborhoods where most of our clients come from. We're developing individualized achievement plans to help each of our clients transition from our, ma our mandated supervision and supports to the natural supports in their home communities that are going to stay with them the rest of their lives. In, re in some respects, that involves us purposely devolving and sharing responsibility for expanding opportunities and client success with the community, which has serious, a serious stake in that success. And then we're reinvesting uh, resources in client communities in the way that science tells us ought to work, and then researching the hell out of that premise to see whether we were right or not. So a little over two years ago, we had two con contracts at the probation department. That was it. That's all we had. We now have 48 contracts through, through YMI uh, with vibrant CBOs who, in some cases, have set up shop right alongside us in our neon offices or where we're actually moved into their offices. So in 2010, we opened our first office in Brownsville, our first neon. In 2012, last year, we opened four more neons, one in Harlem, Jamaica, South Bronx, and Staten Island and four satellites where our staff go into four nonprofit organizations, two in Staten Island, two in Harlem, and see their clients there. And then slated for this coming year, we'll have full-fledged neons in East New York, Bed-Stuy, and satellites in, northern, in the North Bronx and Far Rockaway and Long Island City. Each neon will strive to have the following elements. They'll have the three YMI programs that we got funded, Arches, which is a really cool uh, mentoring and cognitive behavioral program, where um, credible messengers work with the young people. Many of those credible mes messengers have, have themselves been criminal justice involved. SEPS, which is the tutoring and social service support program for uh, peop people on probation who read between the fourth and eighth grade level. Uh, and then Young Adult Justice, Young Adult Scholars, which is an asset-based employment and educational service that promotes civic engagement uh, and, and giving back to communities. Um, how am I doing? How much time I got left? A couple minutes? All right, good. So uh, the other thing that's important, though, is we didn't want to just replace centralized downtown offices by moving into the, into the hood, if you will, and, and have our same sort of centralized uh, bureaucracy ambiance uh, attached to them. So we're really requiring that our staff in those, uh, in those um, neighborhoods uh, establish stakeholder groups, advisory boards, one might call them, in including community members and former system-involved youths, youth, um, uh, probation and parent association meetings, uh, and then we're um, doing asset mapping with the people on probation and the uh, community uh, neighbors to see what kind of assets are available in the community and have our, uh, our staff uh, hook our people up with those. Um, Jeremy Travis, when I explained this to him, he was part of my tour of folks, uh, Jeremy from John Jay, said that if we can really pull this off it'll be what he called a game changer for probation, because so much of probation practice around the country follows the same model, sort of centralized downtown offices, not neighborhood-based. Um, and uh, in order to punish Jeremy, we then uh, embedded two of his researchers in our um, uh, neons, uh, so they're, they're going to be with us for 18 months, at the end of which they'll tell us whether they think this actually uh, is something worth replicating, what we did right, what we did wrong. Uh, so we're sort of opening ourselves up to that, that sort of uh, rigorous review. All right, so I said earlier I'm not going to talk a lot, a lot about close to home. Uh, I'm not going to get into the history or what I consider the Herculean efforts uh, launched in New York City, largely through ACS, uh, their work and dedication. But I am going to spend a couple of minutes just talking about the department's three new programs and our efforts to, to uh, do more objective screening of kids. So uh, the three programs that we, we've launched um, that expand the continuum of care so that the judges have more options, uh, one of them is called AIM, which stands for Advocate, Advocate Intervene, and Mentor. It's an intensive mentoring program uh, with a four-to-one kid-to-staff ratio with advocates and credible messengers from within the community that are supposed to work with families uh, to keep the kids being able to make it at home so that they don't have to get placed. Echoes, every child has the opportunity to excel and succeed. I don't name these things, folks. I just speak about them at conferences, all right? So if you want the uh, email addresses of the people who do name them, I'll give it to me later. Uh, that's a really high intensity level of probation uh, contact with a weekend work component. We do that in partnership with a, with a nonprofit. It's a life coach, coaching and asset-based model 
that has a restorative justice um, uh, component. And then the newest one, which just we just posted up two days ago, I believe now, on our website, is called PEAK, Pathways to Excellent Achie Excellence, Achievement, and Knowledge. It's a really great collaboration with DOE for the kids that get uh, onto probation or in jeopardy of getting violated and returned to uh, or placed in placement uh, because of educational difficulties. So it's an education-focused fo initiative support program with an after-school component. Kids get a lot of help while they're in school, and then afterwards we have an evening after-school component. We feed them. We help them with their homework. We do some counseling. We engage them in arts and recreational activities. It's really good. I think, uh, I think it's going to be one of the cooler programs that we, we've set up. So we also, in, in addition to just throwing a bunch of programs out there, we said we need to really look at how probation makes our recommendations. Judges follow these recommendations 80% of the time, so we want to make sure that we're actually doing the right thing and that they're not all over the board. So we set up a structured decision-making model. We sat down with the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, the judges, ACS, the police, education, and we all sort of consensually agreed on essentially a grid that will um, guide the recommendations of probation based on a kid's offense severity and their, uh, and their risk. Once you're in the grid, obviously we'll try to meet the kid's needs as well, but we don't want to deprive them of their liberty because of their needs. The way we're going to meet their needs, we hope, is through an expanded continuum of care, and we'll continually look at that continuum of care. But when kids are deprived of their liberty, it shouldn't be because they have needs. You shouldn't take a kid out of their home because uh, their parents are messed up. Not for the justice side. Maybe that's what you can do on the child welfare side, but on the justice side, it should be more about risk and severity than about needs. So that, that's been a, a really terrific experience of both formulating that, coming up with the new alternatives, but even before that, negotiating with the state around a public policy that would become close to home, that they're now actually looking to expand statewide for non-secure programs, which means soon, if the governor's budget passes, the state will be out of the business of non-secure programs and maybe one day even limited secure programs. That's been really the best public policy experience of my life. Um, states around the country are now looking at this. The institution-based state centralized juvenile justice system is what has dominated juvenile justice practice since the mid-1800s, and it still dominates it. The mayor, when he announced this, called it a relic of a bygone era. I wish it was a relic of a bygone era. It is what dominates the current era and the current practice of juvenile justice, despite boatloads of data that talk about how destructive placing kids in large, locked institutions far away from their families has become. The largest city in the country has now opted out of that system. And we're going to study it. We're going to work hard to pull it off. And uh, I, I think one day I hope that people will say, we used to send kids to large locked institutions. For, what, what were we thinking? What, what was that about? Right? Because it just makes so much sense to do the opposite. And now my colleague, Commissioner Richter, I'm sure will come up and talk a lot more about how they are doing the bulk of the work to make that work. All right. Um, Ron Richter has been commissioner at ACS since uh, 2011. And prior to that, he was a family court judge in Queens and family services coordinator for the city of New York and ACS director of what do you call it, uh, family court legal services. Uh, Commissioner Richter. The short comparison works on me. Thank you. So there you go. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I was looking at the uh, upcoming event announcement for this morning's program, and uh, it starts out, well, first there's the, the brushes with the law thing to get you all here, um, and that worked. And then it says, um, the city has overhauled its juvenile justice system. So um, I would say the city is overhauling its juvenile justice system. And um, it will always be a work in progress um, because um, as all of you probably know, um, you know, the needs of children and families in this uh, city's ever-changing communities um, will always be changing. Um, having sat in 
uh, a courtroom for just under three years in the extraordinary borough of uh, Queens, um, this city is ever-changing, and that's why we're all here. That's what makes New York City uh, the greatest city on Earth. And so um, we will be overhauling, I hope, our juvenile justice system um, in an ongoing way um, heretofore. Um, what uh, Commissioner Shiraldi, what Vinnie just described, is um, the last decade, and I, I agree that Commissioner Carrion has really been pressing forward with an effort to move um, our juvenile justice system in the state closer to home, having young people nearer to their families, um, nearer to their systems um, for years, because, um, because keeping kids um, far away and keeping them in institutions doesn't make sense. But we'll be overhauling our juvenile justice system, I hope, for forever, um, because the needs of our kids and our families are dynamic. Um, and what we're trying to do in New York City, um, both in child welfare and juvenile justice, I think, is acknowledge um, that each kid um, and each family is unique, um, and that one size doesn't fit all. Um, and the only way that you can do that is by drilling down and trying very hard to get individuals working with individuals so that um, that unique quality of each kid and each family can maybe be recognized by bureaucracies. And bureaucracies are communities too. Um, and um, so a lot of the work that we've been doing at Children's Services about workforce development is recognizing that people make up our communities um, at Children's Services, at our big bureaucracy of 6,500 people, and that focusing on the people who are actually doing the work um, enhances the likelihood that we're going to do the work with our families um, and our communities better. So um, I'm here to talk uh, today about, um, about the work that we've done on Close to Home and that we will continue to do um, in an effort to um, get this right and move it forward. Um, I, of course, want to thank Andrew White, um, the director of the New School Center for New York City Affairs, um, and, and want to acknowledge the great panelists um, who um, are here uh, today. Um, in particular, um, I, I, I think Ruben's work has moved us forward um, by um, making sure that what we do um, is informed by the voices of the people whose lives we affect. Um, and that um, has had a big effect on me personally um, because uh, um, it, it, it reminds us of the unique quality of each person whose lives we're working, um, working alongside, working with, um, and, and makes it much harder to be um, a bureaucracy and be bureaucratic. Um, and I think that I think that 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 movement, which has been I think in New York City around for a long time because of Mike Arsham's work, is now being um, developed in the juvenile justice work, namely getting the voices of young people and families injected into policy decisions and in, in, injected into um, into uh, practice. And I think that that um, that is. Um, certainly a critical part of the ongoing overhauling of our juvenile justice system. Um, so from the ACS perspective, um, input and involvement from both community members and organizations has, in our view, been integral to the development of our major juvenile justice reform initiative close to home and will be crucial um, to our initiative's success moving forward. Um, close to home, as everyone here knows, um, is the reform initiative that um, provides a continuum of services in New York City for young people found to have committed a delinquent act. And instead of sending teenagers to punitive upstate facilities, we're placing them in what are um, monitored small group residential facilities here in the city where they are able to um, have much more interaction with their family members and continue their educations, we hope, seamlessly through programming provided by the Department of Education. Um, seamlessly is, again, the hope. It 
has, as many of the people who are close to this, not been as seamless as we would like. We are working on that. The first phase of Close to Home was launched in September of 2012 for non-secure placements, and this fall we hope to launch phase two for limited secure placements. So, um, with respect to the topic today, which is community input, prior, prior to last year's launch, ACS held a series of five community forums, um, one in each borough, that sought input from residents regarding what they wanted um, this change to look like. Um, and we were particularly interested in hearing from young people um, who had had experience with the city the city and the state's juvenile justice system. And recently we wrapped up an additional five public forums, so 10 in all, where we sought input on limited secure placements, so phase two. And ACS gathered uh, feedback not only from citizens, but also from their elected leaders in the city council, the state assembly, and the state senate, people who represent these communities, our communities. And we were able to incorporate what we learned into our plans for non-secure placement um, that will be reflected in our soon to be released um, limited secure placement plan. And as many of you know, uh, the state law that Governor Cuomo signed on March 31st of 2012 requires us to submit a plan to the state. The purpose of this, um, these 10 public forums, was to ensure that both the non-secure placement and the limited secure placements are reflective of what our communities envision for this phase of reforming, overhauling our juvenile justice system. Um, we wanted to receive input specifically about education, rehabilitation, youth development, ties to the community, and uh, culturally appropriate programming for our young people. And what we heard in, um, in different communities reflected that. Um, the public forum in the Bronx was entirely different than the public forum um, in uh, Queens, and um, that was with respect to limited secure placement. Um, that was true for non-secure placement as well, and some of you in this room came to all of those public forums. Some of you came to a few. I recognize faces. Um, they were really, um, they were really interesting, and and obviously, even though we tried to make very clear that this was about juvenile justice and specifically about limited secure uh, placement um, in the latter five. Um, when the ACS commissioner goes out to our communities, you can only imagine that people bring their child welfare issues to the fore, which makes for, um, you know, an interesting <laughs> evening. <laughs> um, so with respect to community linkages, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our providers in non-secure placement. So we have 11 nonprofit provider agencies that are operating residences, um, and um, we have asked them um, to do specific things to ensure that our residences have linkages to the communities um, that they're serving. So 11 nonprofit provider agencies, many of whom are here in the room, and you'll see that um, we have one joining us on the panel. Um, the the um, 11 nonprofit, nonprofit providers have 33 sites, um, mostly, almost all within the five boroughs of the city. Um, We've asked that the providers um, interface, communicate with um, their local community boards and police precincts prior to opening their residences. So we expected that this um, would be done. Community boards are very um, active in some of our communities and take um, great interest in, obviously, the opening of a residence. Police precincts also um, can, be, um, can, can, can go either way, as many of you know, and can be very, very helpful, um, and, and we've asked our, our providers to, um, to reach out and develop a relationship there. Um, the, um, the, the providers have had varied experiences with this outreach. Um, we have also required providers to develop and operate community advisory boards to help maximize community involvement in and support their non-secure placement residences. And, for those of you who are familiar with OCFS's Brooklyn uh, for Brooklyn model, um, this was a requirement that Commissioner Carrion envisioned for Brooklyn for Brooklyn and was very successful. And in our development of Close to Home, we met with the Community Advisory Board 
um, that Brooklyn for Brooklyn had and found that meeting um, quite compelling um, and, and thought that that was a critical part of the success of Close to Home. Um, these community advisory boards are comp comprised of representatives from local nonprofits, businesses, faith-based organizations, um, in some cases universities that are located near the residents and other interested community members and are required to meet on a quarterly basis at a minimum to help identify avenues for deepening connections between the facilities and the communities. Uh, you know, there are many people who are very interested um, in our young people and their success and their families, and this provides a natural linkage between uh, the residents and, and the community. I'm sure you're gonna hear more about that uh, today. Not only do our providers have community advisory boards, um, but I, as the ACS commissioner, also have, um, have one myself. Um, the community ad com commissioner's advisory board is designed to provide me and my executive team with feedback and input on ACS's initiatives and strategic direction, and we have um, parents who serve on that and, and, um, and a young person who is formally, um, well, actually not formally, currently in the foster care system uh, who serves on that board as well. Um, you know, the goal is to try to find out as much as possible sitting where I sit and for our residences where they sit um, you know, what's going on in and around us because that's the only way our work can reflect that. Um, so I hope this gives you a, a, an idea of, of, of some of how we're trying to ensure that our residences um, have, a, have, a, have a, 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 a formal way of figuring out what's going on in their communities. The providers themselves have deep um, experience in New York City, um, and most of the people that our providers employ live in the neighborhoods where, um, where they're located. And so um, unlike a lot of the places where our young people were placed before, um, hundreds of miles away, um, they're, being, um, they're being surrounded by and making connections with people um, that come from the same places that they come from. And that makes a huge difference. Um, and, um, and so we hope that by the fact that we're using local providers who care about their own communities and their own kids and families, that will naturally um, make um, a difference for our kids. Um, once a young person leaves placement and is receiving aftercare ser services, ACS requires providers to have established linkages with at least three community-based organizations that offer individualized pro-social activities. These include academic support and tutoring, after-school programming, mentoring, vocational counseling, and recreational and cultural programming, and providers must also establish linkages with organizations that provide specialized services for young people with disabilities or who need prenatal or postnatal post counseling and services. How am I doing? I have one minute. That's, the, okay, that's good. I think I probably can do this. Okay, so finally oversight, juvenile justice oversight. That brings us to the topic of oversight. I'm pleased to say that ACS is recruiting members currently to serve on a juvenile justice oversight board. The Juvenile Justice Oversight Board will be comprised of 10 to 15 members appointed by the commissioner who are not employed by ACS or any city or state agency or any provider that is currently under contract with ACS. Board members will serve for two years and we are seeking members with relevant experience including parents and former youth who were involved in the juvenile justice system, professionals from the fields of education, mental health and juvenile justice systems operations, as well as a member of the Legal Aid Society. And Legal Aid, as the representative of children uh, in our juvenile justice system, will have a standing member on the Juvenile Justice Oversight Board. This board will be responsible for examining the operations and conditions of non-secure placement and limited secure placement act, uh, facilities and the activities of ACS employees and providers who are responsible for the planning and implementation of care. It will also investigate reported complaints, visit facilities to gauge the quality and adequacy of conditions, review aggregate data, and meet the agency officials to discuss findings, recommendations, and resolutions of problems which they identify. The oversight board will issue an annual report. Throughout all stages of close to home, we have sought community input and involvement 
to try to ensure its success, the work um, that we have undertaken, we hope builds a partnership between us, our providers, and the communities uh, that we serve. And I want to say that, um, not surprising, um, surprisingly, I guess, to me, and I'm sure you'll have questions about this, um, the implementation of this uh, program so far um, has been, um, you know, I think miraculous, um, a struggle, um, and, um, and exciting. I think most importantly, and I've said this before, um, New York City um, is taking responsibility for New York City's young people, um, and that um, means warts and all. Um, we are having some successes and we are having some struggles, um, but they're our struggles. They're not, um, you know, some county upstate's struggle. So um, when a kid gets in trouble in school, when a kid gets in trouble in a residence, um, when a kid does fantastically well in school, um, we know about it. Um, our judges know about it. Um, our um, our providers know about it, and it's um, and it's it's how it should be because um, kids should not be going hundreds of miles away for seven, you know, odd months and then come back here. Um, that period of absence has never been good and doesn't really make any sense. Um, so now we are um, dealing with those seven months, and um, not surprisingly, they are not an easy seven months. Um, but it's as it should be. Thank you so much. Thank you both. All right, so why doesn't the panel come on up? All right. So I want to start at the far end, um, introducing the, those who haven't spoken yet. Sharif Clayton is program coordinator for the Center for Alternative Sentencing and Employment Services, CASES. He's responsible for uh, program services and CBO linkages for clients. And uh, he'll tell you about the program that he's running within there. Um, next to him is Jamie Capel, who's the Director of Youth and Education Justice at the Children's Defense Fund New York, where she handles the, the sort of policy advocacy around um, issues including youth justice. And uh, prior to CDF New York, sh she lived in Honduras and founded Becca, a nonprofit committed to collaborating with local communities to create locally staffed bilingual schools. Um, next to her is Ruben Austria. Ruben is the founder and executive director of Community Connections for Youth, based in the Bronx, and empowering grassroots faith and neighborhood organizations to develop effective community-driven alternatives to incarceration. And he also works with parents as well as young people. And Cynthia Armijo, who is the executive director of Boys Town, New York. She joined Boys Town four years ago from the YMCA of Norwalk, and where she was CEO. So I want to start by looking at sort of what's happening now, what's working, and what's not. But I guess before we do that, we really need to hear a little bit about the programs that our panelists are running. Um, so, so Sharif, can you talk a l just quickly, in a nutshell, describe the work that you're doing and or how you keep families and young people engaged. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon, good morning. Good morning. My name is Sharif Clayton. I'm program coordinator for CASES. Um, we have a program that is an alternative to detention program funded by the state and the city. And the design of it is to keep children out of detention while their cases are being adjudicated. So we created an after-school program where the children come to us every day, Monday through Friday, and we engage them in various um, programs, everything from um, education, academic tutoring to um, child, uh, teen pregnancy prevention. Um, and so one of the things that we do is in this process of engaging the kids, we remind our staff and each other that we're dealing with children and that they are children and they're children that make decisions um, that are bad decisions. And there's a process of them making these bad decisions. And bad decisions are learned behavior. 
And so what we do is we try to instill behavior in them or decision-making <laughs> processes that will allow them to function in society better. So how do you keep track? Part of this is monitoring also, right? Yes, yes, yes. What does that mean? So you're making sure, so these are kids who would have gone to detention, but instead of gone to your program. Right. And how, how do you make sure they're staying in school and going home? So we monitor their compliance, mm -hmm. right? And um, <laughs> yeah, so we monitor their compliance. And how we monitor it, um, we partner with the Department of Education. We monitor their school attendance. Mm -hmm. We make sure that they have curfew compliance. Their curfew is 8 o'clock. We call, we call their houses every night to make sure that they're home. And then we monitor them coming to our program every day. And, and this gives us the opportunity to engage and intervene when necessary on anything from if they're not going to school, then we try to determine why they're not going to school. Um, oftentimes we find, for example, we find that a lot of times the kids are not going to school and it's a poverty issue, right? They don't have um, adequate clothing to go five days a week. And because of the peer pressure that comes with being able to keep up with the fashion, they'll just opt out of going to school. Right. And so then, you know, it opens up a whole nother spectrum of engagement and some of the work that we have to do in helping them to go to school. So then we start finding resources um, to provide, to help them get clothing. And are they generally going to the school that they were going to before they got involved with police? Um, in some cases, and in a lot of cases, they're in suspension sites. Mm -hmm. And so while they're with us, the, the, the possibility that they will be transitioning back to the original school takes place right. as well. And when you're dealing with, sort of trying to deal with poverty or lack of resources, is that the point where you're working with their parents also? Right, exactly. And what we find is that there, there's a, a, a deficit when it comes to family engagement. Right? We, we simply just don't have the funding um, to help them navigate through some of these issues. You know, um, and we reach out and we find other community linkages uh, to help the, the parents navigate through these poverty issues. Um, we just had recently, for example, we just had a young kid who has not been in school, I think almost the whole school year. You know, and that may be an ACS situation. Mm -hmm. um, but part of the reason that we found out is that he doesn't, his, while his mother doesn't have any medical coverage for him, he don't have eyeglasses. Nice. And he literally can't see. And so what do we do? You know, and these become some of the daily, daily challenges that we face. Right. And so what we did was we found a, a nonprofit that actually provides um, not only uh, eye exams, but free glasses. Mm -hmm. And this is something that, you know, um, probably could have happened in the beginning of the school year if there was, you know, um, somebody that knew that this was the issue. Right. And so I think that on the level that we are on and the day-to-day the -day interaction that we have with the kids, I think it's, it's really important that we ascertain all of the, the dynamics that's taking place with the kids. Right. And then eventually what happens almost 80% of the time is that our children end up on probation. And lastly, the, the, um, with probation, with, with the transition into probation, um, a lot of times what we discovered, we don't, we're not, we haven't been able to um, transfer that information yeah. to probation. So we'll come back to that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ruben, can you tell us about your mentoring programs? Sure. Um, oh, that's live. Uh, so, the program that we run, um, as much as uh, the city has done all of this kind of city-driven alternatives to incarceration, which is great, um, we kind of set up a program that was in response to what I'll call a, a magic RFP, because I've never seen one like it, and I don't know if I'll ever see one again, but uh, it came from the state, and it said, we want to fund a program, and we're not going to tell you what it is. You tell us what it is, and the only condition is that it has to have outside evaluation but we want something that's gonna be a game changer. And uh, I had just started a nonprofit, so I said there's not a snowball's chance in hell that we'll get this grant. Um, so I just wrote it the way that I would like to write it, not what I thought would get funded. And uh, 
kind of put forth the idea of saying, what if we took a, a very small neighborhood, my neighborhood actually, as Vinny told me, that was a very scientific process, uh, <laughs> but the Mott Haven neighborhood of the South Bronx, and said, what if we got uh, several grassroots organizations that have probably never gotten government funding and put together a little collaborative, and we got young people who normally their cases were too serious that they would have to go into the system, uh, but took care of them in the community themselves. And uh, lo and behold, miracle of all miracles, it got funded. Um, and so we, what we've done in the South Bronx is set up uh, a diversion program, and, um, and, and it actually kept on, our point of entry keeps moving backwards. We said what we know we want to start with is grassroots neighborhood organizations in the young people's home communities um, that have been there, been there before they were in system involved, they'll be there while they're system involved, they'll be there long after they're system involved. They're not typically juvenile justice agencies, they're just organizations that do really good youth development, uh, they do good community work, they're kind of part of this uh, hidden infrastructure of a neighborhood. Um, and then we went to system folks, and that's why we say community driven, because we started it ourselves, but we said, you know, who would you send to us? And the conversation actually started out with the prosecutors, um, and the prosecutors said, well, we've got some kids that we typically arrest, and they're kids who are charged with kind of low-level assaults, and they're charged with taking things at school, and uh, these are kids that normally we prosecute their cases, but if there was a robust community alternative at the front end, we'd send those kids to you. And so we started taking those kids, and then um, Vinny started messing things up for us because they started adjusting so many cases that a lot of these cases were no longer making it to the prosecutor's office. Um, but our model wasn't dependent on prosecutorial referrals, so we set up something to take kids as an adjustment. Uh, and then, lo and behold, the NYPD even started to mess up our program model by uh, actually deciding to divert some arrests, which is something that, you know, even a couple years ago I would have said, you know, they'll never do this. But they started calling us up and said, you know, we have a kid that we're supposed to, uh, we're supposed to divert them. What can we do? Can we send them to you? And we said, this is great. So uh, we actually get kids now who are in custody at the precinct and we're a block away and we'll go over and pick them up and try to keep them from uh, coming, uh, just going into the system. But really, the, uh, I think the key of our model is saying that uh, in light of all of these wonderful reforms that are taking place, that should be taking place, that need to continue to take place, um, our strategy is that ultimately system involvement at all uh, is just something that's not good for kids. Um, it might need to be there sometimes, but if, you know, I pose this question to you all, uh, when your kid gets involved in the system, what type of involvement do you want him or her to have? And you'd probably say, well, I don't want my kid involved in the system at all. Uh, and so for us, the answer is building a really robust community infrastructure um, that can catch kids when they get system involved, but that also uh, can work with young people and families uh, before they ever get formally system involved. And we see that a lot with, with, with parents who will say to us, all right, you got my 14-year-old who has a case, uh, can you help my 12-year-old? And we don't want to be in the position of saying, just wait till your 12-year-old you know, commits a felony and then they can get really great services. Um, but to actually have a community container uh, that can work with those kids before they ever get system involved. And so that's a little bit about what our program does. Great. So mark that moment that precinct in Mott Haven is diverting arrests. <laughs> so these kinds of things happen at the precinct level in the NYPD in a few places, which is interesting, as opposed to top level. Um, Cynthia Armijo, uh, at Boys Town, you're running some of the close to home programs. Tell us a little bit about those and what you see as what's working. Thanks, Andrew. Well, we've actually, um, I find it surprising when, when I speak to people and they don't realize that actually we have been providing um, placement homes within New York for the last 20 years, since 1990. Um, a lot of you probably were not aware that these homes uh, were OCFS homes, children post adjudication, uh, were being put into two family style homes in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Um, we have two homes there, one on 6th Avenue and one on St. James Place. Uh, 20 years ago, it was a little different in those neighborhoods, but um, we provide services for children uh, that do go through the system, first in the non-secure detention phase, so when they've been arrested and uh, based on their risk level, they are required to go to a detention home. 
I really don't like the word facility. It instills in our minds uh, a concept of folks with keychains and handcuffs, and it just, it's just, it's a negative. What we call them are homes. Um, we are very strong proponents at Boys Town of a family style environment. This is a very disruptive point for the family and for the child. And so in order to preserve some of the humanity of what they're about to endure for the next 27 days of their detention, um, we bring them to our three, one of our three non-secure detention homes, two in Brooklyn and one in Queens for girls. Um, if during the course of their court phase, it is determined that they will have to go to placement, um, we offer six non-secure placement homes. Uh, and again, they are very neighborhood-based homes. Each home uh, is occupied by a family teaching couple, which is a married couple who live in the home. They have assistance and supports. They're available for them. And then up to six youth live with them in the home as those uh, young men go through their placement phase. And those homes, when I say neighborhood-based, there are two in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, the two I spoke about in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and then two in Long Island City, Queens. And as you walk past them on the street, in fact, uh, a couple of you have even said, I didn't even know there was a home on uh, 6th Avenue in Park Slope. Um, you will see kids outside uh, doing their daily chores. Uh, there will be an adult with them. Uh, as they get close to transitioning back to their family home, we work intensively with their families. Um, a lot of times, the, the source of issues for them before they can return home, the family needs a little bit of fixing. And so our aftercare services are there to provide support for the family and try to understand what the issues were that may have gotten the young person into trouble in the first place. Uh, a lot of those issues are very common. It's a lack of supervision. There may be only one parent at home, and the parent has to work. There may be younger siblings at home, and the parent has to devote attention to the younger siblings. Um, so we will work with the family in order to provide uh, a better environment that that young person will then return to. And then once they're discharged from our care, um, we'll work with the family for six months or as long as is needed with the family to ensure that that transition back into the community uh, is safe. Um, I'd just like to say that while the kids are with us, again, um, our philosophy is very family-based. We want to teach the kids the skills, learn the behaviors that will help them succeed once they leave Boys Town. Um, so it is a skills-based program, positive reinforcement with, with the kids, a continual teaching model so that the children are continually being taught to. And the model that we employ is what we call evidence-based meaning that it has been researched, it has been in place for a long time, and we have measurable outcomes that we can replicate over time, both in the home and once the children leave us. All right. All right. Thanks. Um, Jamie Capel, can you speak just a little bit about what you see as working well in all of this, and then sort of some of the concerns you've got around both close to home and around the sort of larger situation around what, what we're all calling the school to prison pipeline? Absolutely. Um, and first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, it, there is so much that we should celebrate. Um, that just to see how systems have moved forward um, in many ways in great partnership with community, this is a really exciting time. Um, as the advocate on the panel, though, of course, I do have the opportunity to point to some of the opportunities that we have to do better by our young people. And um, a couple of things that really concern us at the Children's Defense Fund um, one, I think, is an opportunity. Um, we do now have our young people closer to home. We are being very intentional about the services that we're providing them um, in a way that really speaks to trying to do positive youth development, really focusing on strengths. But from what we've heard, one of the areas in which we believe there's an, uh, the most opportunity and the most need for growth within the Close to Home Initiative is a part of the experience, while there's, there's much happening in the facilities that we hope will kind of continue to strengthen and grow as the initiative rolls out, one of the things that we are most concerned about is the experience that those non-secure placement children are having in their, in their schools. Um, and so what, what we understand to be one of the challenges is that we have young people who are being served in schools in the Bronx. and. Um, in addition to the logistical challenges that we can appreciate of just getting the young people to school every day, 
Um, we understand that there hasn't really been any additional funding provided to those schools other than you know the normal city tax levy that would serve children in a school and so there are no school-based health centers for example in these facilities there are not and this is the part that horrifies me the, the most there are not even nurses in these schools and so when you think about the tremendous needs that this population have uh, the fact that many of them likely have serious meds, uh, the fact that there is no nurse in these schools, to me is a cause for concern because I'm sure that uh, whether they want to, to resort to these things or not, the alternative to not having medical professionals at hand is going to sometimes be EMS referrals. It's going to be arrests. It's going to be uh, interventions that, while no one may want to rely upon them, may be the only option that they have at the moment. And so I, we think that there is great intention around better serving these young people's needs. There are lots of things that are happening within the facilities to support their educational needs, but when it comes to their daily academic experience in school, we have an opportunity to think creatively. We all know that there are budget constraints. Um, but we think that there can and should be a conversation about how can we leverage existing funding streams to better serve this population. So that would definitely be one thing that I would lift up in the context of moving forward with juvenile justice reform as we have our limited secure children coming back. That will be a different approach to education. But we really should be thinking about that. Um, and then I would say that, you know, oversight, it, it's tremendous. The amount of thought that ACS has put into the oversight of the Close to Home initiative is, is truly laudable. Um, and it is really exciting. I know that the Children's Defense Fund was really pleased that the legislature included so much language in the legislation requiring there to be community feedback. And then, though, to see the way that ACS has really lifted that requirement up and engaged in a process of seeking community input, that is definitely exemplary. I think that what we think about now is how will we use all the ways in which community input is being offered to have a very public conversation about are we serving our children well. So the creation of the Juvenile Justice Oversight Board, um, the fact that there's an ombudsperson at both OCFS, or an ombudsperson function at OCFS and that they are doing that same function at ACS, these are opportunities. What is an advocate, I hope, is that the information that is gathered through all of those different mechanisms can really be shared fully and holistically with community so that we can really understand are children succeeding academically are succeed are they succeeding socially what are their experiences looking like in the facilities and that is because we're so new to this initiative something that is yet to really be determined everyone knows and, and several people have said it that there have been challenges with the rollout we do have amazing service providers who yes are not new to this to this work but this is a new population and I think that that has come with in the in the midst of a necessarily quick rollout a number of challenges around understanding really specifically the very intensive needs of the young people who have been coming back closer to home. Right. So those those are things that I would highlight. And then I, I'd love to talk about raise the age. I don't know if you'd like me Let's to Let's come back to that. that. Okay. Um, so this question of the link to schools, I mean, it's sort of emblematic to many of the other things that we're sort of feeling our way through. But that was one of the great challenges, sort of the failures of the early ATD programs also, is getting, keeping the kids in school, providing real schooling. What is happening within close to home in terms of education? Ron? <laughs> um, I think that, does this work? Can you all hear me? I, I think that I should be deputized a chancellor, <laughs> <laughs> or at least a deputy deputy assistant deputy <laughs> chancellor. And I am, I am in, in conversations with Dennis Walcott about that possibility. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I think that uh, Jamie raises a real, um, you know, a, a, a real issue um, and one that we have been working hard on. Um, I, I, um, I, ooh, oh, that's me. Um, I, I think that, um, first of all, we are keeping um, data on the number of New York City credits <laughs> that our young people are earning in the Passages Academy, which is the district that our young people attend school in uh, since Close to Home started. 
and, um, and we are proud that our kids are earning DOE credit, um, our 213 young people who have come to, um, to District 79 since Close to Home started on September 1st. I think our first kid actually came on the third, maybe. But, um, but kids are earning credit uh, here in New York City. Having said that, um, there's no question that um, the, the challenge for us school-wise is um, as follows. We have um, contracted with providers who are, um, um, who are, um, have, have developed residences where they have trained staff to provide a particular model mm -hmm. for kids. Um, that is a very intentional model, and you heard uh, Cindy talk about how intentional Boys Town's model is, which is, you know, one of the models. We also have seven of our 11 providers um, who are using the Missouri model or an adaptation of the Missouri model, which are really intense models um, that um, everyone in a, in, a, in a facility is trained, or a, I should say a home or a residence are trained to use. And then you have young people who are um, transported to school, like most kids go to school, and they're going to a Department of Education run um, school building where their <coughs> teachers are DOE staff, and, you know, teachers like our, our kids go to school and they have teachers. And those teachers are um, following the rules of the Department of Education to teach kids, like every other teacher in New York City. And they're not Missouri model mm -hmm. teachers. They're teacher teachers. Mm -hmm. And so you also have them putting kids in classrooms where um, they're um, hopefully, and this is a struggle too, trying to arrange kids in classrooms not in their groups that they come, f come um, to school from where they're in their groups that are Missouri model groups from their various residences, but they're put in classrooms by virtue of their skill set, but their, their grade level, their uh, academic achievement and abilities. And so it isn't a consistent um, situation and it's a real challenge. And that's presented some challenges in terms of how the school situation is aligned with the um, residence situation and the model that we're using. And we knew this was going to happen and we've been working on it, but when the kids start coming and it all starts happening, it becomes complicated. Um, and so we have had some of our young people, um, where possible, be educated in their residences and with limited secure placement, the plan that we're proposing to the state will have all of the young people actually educated in residence, so we won't have this problem because they'll be educated with their groups. Um, and some programs like Boys Town, I think, are you, you, you have your own We have the District setting. 79 Passages Academy. Right, so some, some of our providers actually have their own schools. Um, but we have an issue with our schools that we are, that we are really working on. Um, I um, had not heard, and I'm happy to now here and take into consideration the issue that Jamie raises with respect to medical concerns in the schools. I know that District 79 has um, uh, medical staff as do um, the other districts, but th it's important to raise and important to bring to my attention, which I will of course um, now work with the district on and, and, um, and, and, and a, fair, a fair issue to raise. Right. In a way, this gets, I mean, this is a relatively small number of young people we're talking about in these programs, right? And it gets back to this thing that I think Ruben and Sharif both brought up. This, so when you're talking about the kids who are adjusted or are in alternative to placement programs or alternative to detention programs, you're talking about a much larger universe. What kind of resources are there, Ruben, what kind of resources are there in the neighborhoods where you're working to support those kids, not just in education, but after school, other programs that they need, and how are you dealing with that? Yeah, so I, I think I'd like to frame those comments again in terms of uh, bringing together two things that are sometimes thought of as separate, you know, and one is juvenile justice reform and one is community capacity building. 
And to really say that at a certain point, once you hit a certain point, there really is no juvenile justice reform without community capacity building. Uh, and I say that to say that the, the, you know, for those of us who are advocates and have been frustrated with the juvenile justice system, we're often accusing it of, of a lot of things that, you know, it's doing pretty poorly. You know, I mean, it's, it's a bad place for most kids. But a lot of the kids who get stuck in the juvenile justice system are getting stuck there because all of these other systems and all of these other resources uh, are, have either failed them or have not been mobilized towards them as well. Um, I would say that in terms of the needs of a lot of these kids, uh, it's really, uh, there's, it's a question of getting um, the, the pre-existing community supports that are in our community and that are working for a lot of young people who have a lot more advantages uh, is to get that network uh, kind of overlapped with these kids who are in the system. And that's, that's a challenging thing to do because if you kind of look at the history, you could ask it by a simple question of, of what, what percentage of dollars that are in the kind of juvenile justice reform world are going into community capacity building, are going into community partnership development um, and it's a, it's a pretty small amount. Um, the amount that is kind of dedicated to system reform, right, or to enhancing system practices and getting better trained system professionals and, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, there's a lot more resources going into there than to saying let's get a whole bunch of community folks who uh, don't think like us, don't talk like us, have not been funded by us, and let's throw them all in the same room together and see what happens. And that's messy and that's scary and it's uncomfortable because uh, you're talking about a shift in power dynamics. Um, but I think it also gets some of the best results. Uh, so there's been, you know, I think some exciting developments in that regard. You know, Commissioner Schiraldi, you know, agreed to meet with a group of our parents on a monthly basis. And they probably spent the first meeting just yelling at him <laughs> for things that he had no control over. Uh, and then after that, by the second meeting, you know, got to talk about what were some real ways that, that families could be strengthened. And um, the I, second half of the second meeting. Second half of the second <laughs> meeting. Um, but, but I think one of the things that has to happen in every community, you will bring infrastructure of grassroots organizations, faith-based organizations that are kind of under the radar, right? They've never been funded. Um, they're usually just kind of involved in doing what they do because they do it. Um, but I really believe that it's tapping into that network uh, that makes the magic. Uh, we have uh, Maurice Winley here, who's the project coordinator of Arches, and, and Commissioner Sheraldi mentioned Arches. One of the great things about Arches is that Arches brought to the table a bunch of organizations that had never been formally involved in juvenile justice reform but organizations like Harlem Commonwealth Council that now that they're getting involved in working with kids in the justice system, uh, it's like my hope is that juvenile justice gets into their DNA. And so they start thinking, well, we've got all these real estate projects and we've got business development and what if we got you know, the kids in Arches into that type of intervention, a type of intervention that has nothing to do with juvenile justice, but it has everything to do uh, with integrating young people into the fabric of community. Right. And that's something that I think, you know, is really the next step that, that every juvenile justice reform uh, process should be saying, what are we doing to enhance community capacity so that less of the burden falls on us? So let's talk a little bit about that. that there is that power dynamic. I mean, it's one thing to have an advisory role for the community boards and so on. It's a whole other thing to create an oversight body like ACS is doing or to deal with the kinds of meetings that uh, Commissioner Sheraldi has spoken about. How, sort of how do you set up a um, sort of a, net, a system of, of formal, powerful advice from community people that doesn't just have the power dynamic of we are the trained professionals, you are the folks who are just beginning to learn what this is all about and we can bulldoze right over you. How do you, how do you, I know goodwill is one thing, but how do you structure it in a way that lasts? Commissioner Sheraldi, you wanna take that first? Well, and I think, I think you do, even though I joked about it when I started, I think you need to overlay onto this, how do you do it when you got 10 months left too? Right. Because uh, what, what really we should all be thinking about is durability for some of this stuff right, right. now. Because if, if Commissioner Richter and I go away and the goodwill changes, right, which 
which it could or it might not. I'm not saying you know we're any better or worse than anybody else, but but it could, mm-hmm. um, especially with pesky things like parents hollering at you and people overseeing your f- correctional facilities. Right? That's right. pesky. Right. Um, and um, so you, you have to make it as durable as you can. I think I think there's sort of two thoughts I have on that. One is to write it into law, like it's sort of written in. Mm-hmm. Even though Commissioner Richter went beyond what the law required, there is a requirement in the law, and we negotiated that requirement, and we didn't resist that requirement. We were supportive of that, and um, I think that's good. It's in the damn law. And <laughs> so at some point, uh, even if a commissioner thinks they know better, they still got to have a pesky commission or oversight body uh, attached to their stuff so that citizens will take a look. And, I, and you know, I think the history of... Correctional facilities, no matter how you do them, is they're always better if there's some sunshine in them, mm-hmm. right? The other thing is we got to create a demand, right? Part of the reason that there is uh, uh, an oversight law written into this is because pesky advocates demanded it, <laughs> right? Now, we didn't fight it, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure we would have invented it, right? But they did, and they got to us, and they got to the state, and we said, yeah, you know what? They're probably right. Let's put it in there. But I'm not sure we would have done it on our own. Right, and and so right now, my feeling is, we are creating per, at probation a lot of avenues for advocates to be in the room, and for service providers to be in the room, and for neighborhood people to be in the room. Once I'm gone, democracy's got to kick in, and people got to say, "Hey, wait a minute, you can't close my neon. This is our neon. Mm-hmm. It's not probation. It's not Vinny's neon. It's not probation's neon. This is my Brownsville neon. I want mm-hmm. this open." This is better. I don't want my son to have to go down downtown Brooklyn. I don't want my neighbor to have to go to downtown. Mm-hmm. I want them here. And when they, they when they do a mural, when they plant trees, when they do good community works, I want them to do it in my neighborhood because here's the neighborhood they damaged when they did their bad thing, right? And I'm on their advisory board, and damn it, don't close this down, right? So, I, I think part of it is we have to legally, structurally put it in there, and the other part is we have to sort of let this this community of people who care about uh, these things carry them forward to the new elected officials, be they a new mayor or new city council members, to demand this kind of openness in government and this kind of interaction with uh, advocates, providers, regular old community folks that, you know, assuming people think this is a good thing, they got to pick a fight and, right. and, and get it to keep happening. I'd like to make a comment on that, and that is um, we, as the service <coughs> providers, the agencies who are charged with care and custody of the children, have also now been charged with advocacy, which is a challenge that the commissioners have given to us to say, you are not just there for the care and custody of the children anymore, you are actually the child's advocate, which we, we like to believe we are. We're going to stand up for these kids as if we were their parents, but it goes way beyond that. Because the biggest challenge that we find once you know, a child has been in the system and then now is returning, you don't just open the door and then they're going to go to school the next day or they're going to go play basketball after school or they're going to get their homework done. It's our job to form that linkage with the next partner in the community. So upon entry into Boys Town, and a lot of the other agencies will tell you this, the first thing we do is make a community connection. Okay, In our case, it, it could be something as simple as bringing them to the local YMCA and getting them a card. You know, when a kid gets that first ID card and they see their name on it, wow, I'm, I'm actually a member of this YMCA or, you know, whatever the community, Boys and Girls Club, whatever it's going to be. For them, it's, it's a click. I'm now a part of a positive community organization. And what we want to build is citizens, right? right? We, we don't want just these, these, it's a really rough time. High school's tough on any kid. But now you've, you've removed them from their high school setting you know, for a year, however long it has been that they've been in, incarcerated. You want to get them back into that community and feel comfortable in that community. And it's about the com- community feeling comfortable having that child back right. in there, too. So. Which gets, I mean, that's the other side of community involvement, right? On the one hand, you want to hope that most of it is about supporting the kids. On the other hand, I mean, uh, Commissioner Richter, if you on the child welfare side, I'm sure you've had this experience of, you know, something goes wrong and, and suddenly the, the outcry in the community is against the sort of more progressive policies that you're, you want to create. How do you, um, how do you adapt this system so that it doesn't get caught up going the wrong direction? I mean, just to add uh, a, a little bit to what Commissioner Schiraldi said, 
I, you know, I also think that there has to be some uh, structure in communities for the opportunity to, um, to, to advocate from um, a point of departure. You know, I, I think that forums like this are very important, but, you know, each, t each of the 10 public forums that we had um, in connection with Close to Home um, were, were ex extraordinarily well attended. I mean, I think that, I think that um, 150, 200 people from the community came out, not every single one. I, I would say eight out of the 10 had 150 to 200 people. So maybe we had two that were, you know, more around 100. I mean, Staten Island, probably we didn't have 150 to 200 people. And, um, but we really had an, uh, an overwhelming number of people who were very interested in, in connecting with this big government agency. But I do think that, that, that um, there needs to be a, a structure in which, uh, in which community members can speak to um, to government, and I don't think that is necessarily government's responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think that that is um, a lot of others' responsibility, and and will be much more powerful if it's not government. Uh, I also think that um, people have to demand that government picks up the phone and listens, and government is here listening, and government um, is responsive, um, and uh, and that's my job. Mm -hmm. That's our job. Um, and uh, and that makes this job much more challenging. But that's what you know. That's the purpose. Right. Um, so the question was, how do you not have something terrible that happens completely change the paradigm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and I and I think that I'm you know, I'm not as experienced in in this. You know, I I was at ACS for a, for a couple of terrible. Monumental, ter monumentally terrible things, um, but I wasn't the commissioner at the time, so I'm not as, um, you know, well versed in in this. But I I I, I do think that um, this is a very important question for, um, you know, for 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 any mayor or governor of any. Um, you know, any large or small municipality. I mean, anyone who follows child welfare right now can look at the state of Tennessee and see what is going on. Tennessee just lost um, a relatively new commissioner. Um, I believe it's Commissioner O'Day. Um, and uh, and w is going through a very challenging time right now. Um, it's up to the executive to um, support the strategic plan and mission and goals of a commissioner and be behind that commissioner. And if a tragedy befalls the jurisdiction, which is sometimes gonna happen when you are predicting human behavior and making social work decisions, if you're going to, you know, if, if, if you're going to stop supporting a strategic plan and a direction because tragedy happens, then that is a reflection of you know how much you believe in the strategic plan. I mean, I think that Tennessee is a complicated situation, but I think that Mayor Bloomberg has supported his leaders in child welfare because I think from my work at City Hall, he understands and appreciates the complex lives of our families, and, I, and he does. And, um, and he understands that these cases are extremely challenging and people's lives are not predictable. And if someone has done a good job trying to predict it and taken into consideration the factors, then you don't, you know, you don't change a commissioner because they had an, an agency confront an extraordinarily challenging case, which everyone knows our families are as complicated as, you know, as our families are as complicated as our families. <laughs> Oh, there you go. So getting back to that oversight board, um, as Vinny was saying, this is sort of rooted in law, but you went beyond the law. Is this something that can be set up and then, say, a Mayor Loda could, could get rid of it? Or is there some, or whoever else becomes mayor, is, it, is there some basis to build on to set this up as a formal, ongoing oversight board? Um, 
So I don't think I get to make the laws, do I? <laughs> <laughs> but, but what is Only its, if they're so good what ones. Is its root in law? <laughs> um, so uh, does someone else want to take that question? I have a thought. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I you know, <laughs> we, we are, um, yeah, someone else answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna as, as Commissioner Schiraldi said, there is, <laughs> go ahead, Jamie. <laughs> well, I'm gonna drill into the details of it so it's not a comprehensive answer, yeah. but it is something where, and I don't envy, envy um, our dear commissioners who are so brave to always be here in front of us. Um, That's why we get paid the big money. <laughs> Amen. Um, I, you know, I, I do think that there is uh, one opportunity in particular that, that ACS has um, a tremendous opportunity in, and in particular that, you know, doesn't necessarily... We have so many opportunities. Yes. Well, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily guarantee that what you do in, in the instance I'm about to mention will certainly be, you know, baselined or, you know, but that there will need to be an ongoing commitment to it. But I think when it comes to Andrew's broader initial question around how do you really balance this kind of legislated need to engage community and the, the kind of emphasis on needing to create structures that are going to work, mm -hmm. um, limited secure, we know that ACS has been working really hard to get feedback on that, you know, roll out of that part of close to home. And while non-secure placements are going well with some significant challenges, a lot of us are very concerned that with the limited secure population in particular, there has been, and we haven't seen the final plan yet, there has been, for very good reasons in many instances, this kind of focus on the need to make those limited secure facilities very secure. And so what that may unintentionally create, if it's not done right, is if these are facilities, facilities, and I use that word because I think it's relevant, in communities with bars and kind of, you know, with razor wire and these kinds of things, it is going to send a message to community that these are dangerous children. And I think we'll have an opportunity later in the conversation to talk about the, the the messaging around public safety, which is, I think, something where we unintentionally or intentionally do a lot of harm to our young people, and I think we need to be having a different conversation about public safety. Like I said, I don't envy the commissioners mm -hmm. in having to balance the need to keep children and communities safe, but I think when we think about the mechanisms within Limited Secure in particular, it is an opportunity to send the right message to the community that, yes, we have brought these children closer to home because we want them to engage with you. And if they're not leaving their facilities to go to school, which is something a lot of us are concerned about, well, we understand the, in the intentionality there. We're concerned. If these are young people who are in facilities closer to home, but they rarely leave those facilities, how are they benefiting from being closer to home? And I, and I know that's something ACS has been thinking a lot about, and so we look forward to seeing that plan. But I, I you know, it really, the, the way that all of this has been rolled out has been artful, and artful with real intention behind it, and so that's why we just wanna make sure that the community really, that, that there is a genuine commitment to the fact that community should be engaged, and so being very careful around that the, the kind of messages that are not spoken that we send about our children is, is certainly one that I think will be important in the kind of the detail of right. ensuring people are committed to moving this forward regardless of who's our next mayor. Ruben. Yeah, I wanna suggest three things um, that I can suggest because I'm not a city commissioner. <laughs> um, but one is that uh, there should be oversight, the oversight should be independent um, the members probably should be appointed outside of the power of the commissioner. And I say that because if the next commissioner is not as progressive as Commissioner Richter and decides to just put people who won't kind of rock the boat or push the envelope, then we can have a very closed system once again. And like Commissioner Chiraldi said, these systems, they're inherently risky places for kids. Um, and they benefit, I think, from as much sunlight, like you said, as possible. So having uh, it be as open as possible, independent members appointed. I also think members of the advisory board should be able to go into facilities unscheduled. Uh, I don't know about you, I only clean my house well when people are coming to visit, and I know when they're coming to visit. Um, but I think that's the type of transparency that should be there. The other thing is I think there must be uh, right now, ACS reports all of the incidents that happen in their secure facilities to the city council on a quarterly basis. 
Um, if you haven't seen the numbers, they're pretty scary um, in terms of, I mean, they're getting better, but the number of youth on youth assaults, the number of times that staff had have to use restraints on young people, the times that those restraints have resulted in serious physical injury or minor injury, um, that data should be out there and reported under close to home. Again, like Commissioner Schiraldi said, it's pesky. Nobody wants people peering over your shoulder, but I think it's in the interests of kids to have that information out there. And then I think finally, if you're talking about sustainability, um, having the, you know, there's a question that I always ask is kind of what percentage of dollars are, uh, you know, required or are actually going to subcontract grassroots community organizations to come in and, and provide these services? Because something different happens when there's people who are kind of outside of the system, uh, in the building and in the conversations. Um, you know, and I'll give an example. When I was doing some religious services at an OCFS facility, the kids told me, you know, the, the staff, they used to be able to beat us up and now they can't. So now when we get out of hand, they call the police and the police come in and beat us up. And they just came in, you know, uh, you know, last night and there was a, you know, because there was one kid didn't want to go to bed, but they wound up, you know, you know, they, telling these stories about getting their heads shoved in the ground and kind of doing all these things. And, um, and it's the type of thing that, when young people say this stuff is not always heard, um, you know, and they told me as I was in there as in a chaplain capacity and I told the chaplain and he had to make a report and, you know, it, it kind of gets that stuff out there. But it's the type of stuff that unfortunately happens way too often in facilities. Um, and it's I think we're all just better off when you kind of have a, a lot of transparency around what's happening and why. And it's again, it's messy. It's uncomfortable. Um, it, it doesn't make us happy to kind of be talking about stuff that we'd rather sweep under the carpet, but it's, it's kind of better to get it out there in the sunlight. And I think you get it out there when you have mechanisms that say you're always going to have some people at the table who are going to raise the things that people don't want to talk about because it doesn't make the whole thing look good. Right. Sharif, the, the, one of the things you talked about um, with us before is the, the, when you first start working with these young people and their families, there's not a lot of trust in what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, which gets to this larger point. I don't know that there's a lot of trust or knowledge out in communities in New York City about what's going on in the system, right? I mean, what, what happens? How do you bring people along to understand the value of what's being done in your program? Right. Um, let me just jump um, real quick into community linkage mm -hmm. um, because we do it from a different perspective. So, for example, um, when our children are about to phase out of our program, when we know that they're up for a disposition, which will ultimately lead to probation or, you know, they just their case is over, right. we try to link them into community-based organizations in their neighborhood. And one of the limits that we find is that there are a host of great organizations in every community that we, we deal with our kids. The problem is, is that these organizations only have like a five block radius right. before the kid that lives on the six block can't go right. because of, you know, we got beef with this block or we got problems with this. And so the, and some of these facilities are well funded, um, great facilities, got all kind of services in place. But literally a kid that lives six blocks away or even a project building away can't attend it. Is it because you know? of turf issues among yeah, the kids? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's the culture um, of these communities mm -hmm. that we deal with. And I'm, and I'm wondering now as I'm listening, I'm wondering how um, the kids in, in secure programs, I mean secure fac not facilities or homes and stuff, when they go back into the community, how is the transition going to work in that? Because we're having a problem dealing with it without them, you know, without them even being in in facilities right and what about those kids that when they come out how do you phase them back into these communities with the same cultural problems taking place yeah and that's that's where an investment really has to be made in a level of planning that can't be done at the downtown level mm -hmm. um, it has to be done at the grassroots level because young people will tell you about these issues right. and neighbors will tell you about these issues most of our planning, and I understand it's New York City, right? It's got to start on Beaver Street or William Street. But if you don't invest in a planning process that gets down to that micro neighborhood level, 
And it's not even the precinct level or the community district level. It's actually a neighborhood within a neighborhood to find out what do the people on the ground here uh, recommend in terms of getting these kids successfully engaged. Um, then you're still going to get a lot of recycling. Um, and that's, that's, again, that's one of the hardest things to do because I understand from the downtown level, it's like, well, who's even out there? But that's why it's really important to invest in, I think, a, a, a comprehensive planning process. One of the things we're doing in the 44th Precinct right now is we're just getting the arrest data from all, everybody about where the arrests are happening, talking to them, why is it happening? And it's happening in multiple spots throughout the 44th Precinct, but it's that exact type of analysis that has to happen to say, well, you got this crew on this side and this one on this side, and we're going to have to actually have two programs here because they're not going to cross over to Grand Concourse, right. Right. you know, or as bad things will happen. Right. Right. And these are monumental dilemmas, like right. when we're dealing with the families and the kids. And so um, the question you raised about how do we how do we get the parents to buy in, one of the things that we, we have to convince them, like from the gate, is that we are not the police. You know, we have to say that. We're not the police. We're not ACS. Um, because of the stigma that's attached to both of those entities. You know, we're not here to, to, to um, invade your life and make it worse or anything like that. We're here to, to work with you and your children. And, and once we're able to convince them, and sometimes it doesn't work because they heard that before, you know, but um, once we're able to convince them, those usually are the kids that we have the quantifiable success. Right. Like we can see that. It, you know, we, we can alter, we can get them into um, programs and, and get them the services that they need and they'll willingly go. Right. You know, sometimes we make, um, we, we do this, this tremendous like um, evaluation of the kids. We do psych socials and we finally get an understanding of the kid and then the program is over, right? And so now we need to transition them to probation. Well, we're sitting on these psych socials. And we never get a call saying like, "What's going on with these kids?" Right. You know, so that somewhere in one of the um, reports it says that the kid smoked marijuana. Well, marijuana is not the problem; it's only the solution. You know, I mean, it's only the symptom. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Freudian slip right there. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not the solution; it's the symptom. Yeah. Marijuana is the symptom, right? And you know, but what'll happen is that will become the recommendation. Um, that's what will happen with probation. Probation will take them and um, put them in a drug treatment program, but that's just the symptom. That's right. not the problem. Right. If and, you take and, one thing away yeah. from this mm -hmm. today, is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, but in, yeah. in truth, in, in truth, we. Um, I think I just I'm, and I keep hammering at it, but it's the um, continuity of right. information, the, right. the flow, like. There's a disruption from agency to agency, from nonprofit to to um, government agencies about these children's lives. Right. So we're gonna. I want to take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and hold it there because we're gonna bring mics around. And as they're doing that quickly, sort of aftercare from kids coming out of close to home. How do you make sure that it's done in a way that addresses the issues that we just heard about? So, um, you know, we, the, 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 I, I want to acknowledge that the issues that are being raised are, um, you, know, ex, you know, the ones that we're grappling with. I mean, this is the, you know, New York City does not have four communities. You know, this is not Daytona Beach. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, this is really hard, and our kids are diverse, and, you know, you don't go to a close-to-home um you know, residents and find the kids that are, they're not all the same. And so, um, you know, uh, that makes the challenge, you know, that makes the challenge harder. Um, and so getting input from communities um, is, uh, is critical, um, doing it in an organized way so that what our plan looks like and what our work looks like is reflective of the needs of our different young people is, is um, is a is is a big undertaking, um, and uh, you know, and so it's a, it's a uh, an ongoing process. And in terms of aftercare, um, we did uh, uh, on RFP a request for proposals, and um, you know, we're in the process of sort of um, seeing who proposed. 
Um, and so we're hope, hoping that some of this, um, I think, uh, ongoing um, urging mm -hmm. that there be smaller organizations, we hope that that will, that that will have come through in the people who, or the proposers, the organizations that sought, uh, you know, to, that sought to be aftercare providers for mm -hmm. non-secure uh, placement. Um, I, I, I don't know. If they have the capacity, yeah. If they have the capacity, yeah. I mean, it's, but as you've said, it's not a huge population right. of kids. So we'll see if that, we hope that that, you know, that that, that by doing this RFP that we'll get some of that. Right. Over there. to take that one. Yep. <laughs> Um, so thank you for that question. And it's something that the Children's Defense Fund certainly thinks about a lot. We're a part of a, a coalition called the Dignity in Schools Campaign that is primarily student and parent led, where we're really looking at the incredibly detrimental impact of punitive discipline and policing in our schools. And you know, just to throw out some of the numbers which horrify me on a daily basis, there was an improvement in, the num in, a, in terms of a reduction in suspensions. But for me, when you hear that the schools went from 74,000 in 2010-11, to 69,000 suspensions, and then you think about the amount of time children are losing from school, especially in this incredibly, incredibly intense focus on test prep that we have, it's horrifying. And the reality is that there really are these two distinct pieces of what's happening around quote unquote discipline in our schools. There is the fact that the discipline code has tremendous, uh, is, it's a, first of all, nobody, I'm, kudos to you, nobody reads the discipline code, and that's one of the biggest problems, um, because people don't know their rights. So, you know, children who are um, offered, or children who are um, given a superintendent suspension, which is six days or more, many of those children end up with a suspension of 30 days or more. The, my understanding is that only 12% of families, the, a child given a superintendent suspension is entitled to a hearing. I think it's only 12% of those families who actually go for the hearing because they're basically counseled in too many instances by the school that, oh no, you should just, just accept the charge, serve the time, it's, you know, it's gonna be much easier. And so these children are really being, in some ways, denied their due process. So that's one thing that's really important to keep in mind. Then I think we have to be, not only is the discipline code a problem, the fact that there is the NYPD School Safety Division and the DOE, and they're both in our schools, and the, and the NYPD is in our schools in huge numbers. There are 5,200 school safety agents trained exclusively, almost exclusively, by the NYPD School Safety Division. 5,200 of them. There are 3,200 guidance counselors in our schools. So when you look at the fact that those individuals, many of whom are incredibly well-intentioned, are trained primarily and almost exclusively in policing tactics, you can think about the kinds of interactions that they're having. They're having interactions that have led to 900 arrests in our schools in this last year. There were 1,600 summonses. When you think about the ways in which these experiences very, very, very clearly are channeling our, our children into both the juvenile and criminal justice systems from our schools directly, there is absolute 
excuse me, absolutely the need to, to move on this, to be outraged by it as community members. But the problem is that this is where the conversation around public safety has to be a different one. Right. 150,000 of our children pass through metal detectors. And anyone who's been in a school recently knows that this is not your happy little metal detector where they're like, oh, just walk around it. This is take off your belt, take off your, your hat, take, you know, empty your pockets. It is, even in the best intention schools, an incredibly invasive process for 13, 14, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds who may have had a bad morning. Right. The amount of flare ups are awful. So, anyway, all of this is to say that many of us are looking at the intersection. And this is where I think that when we talk about things like um, the need to raise the age, when we look at things like the way children are educated in the Close to Home Initiative, there is a tremendous opportunity to do it better. But we have to be more intentional around ensuring that the philosophy behind Close to Home is embedded in our schools that are serving those children. But we really have to back it up so fewer children come into interaction, interaction with juvenile justice and criminal justice by agreeing that it's time to stop investing so heavily in police and start investing in our children. We need more supports and we need fewer police in our schools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Over here. Uh, we were promised that we would get back to at least a brief discussion of the Raise the Age project. Is that still possible? Yeah. Very quickly. <laughs> And one of, the, one of the interesting aspects of this is, you know, the Child Welfare Watch Advisory Board, which does the recommendations, decided with much discussion to support Lipman's proposal, which would move um, sort of halfway. It wouldn't address issues of, of violent children, 16 and 17 year olds. It would deal with nonviolent kids and move them into an alternative process, which would deal with a large group but not the whole thing. And I know Jamie's organization and a lot of other organizations have a very diff have a much stronger take on this, that this has to be done. It's a really difficult question. Um, we don't really have time to debate it, but if there's anybody on the panel who wants to comment on it quickly, on what's happening with Raise the Age, which I wouldn't true, the bill before the legislature would not truly um, raise the age of criminal responsibility. It would just create an alternative track for nonviolent 16 and 17 year olds or those who've been charged with nonviolent crimes. And I know I just talked at great length, so I promise Andrew to be okay. more brief, but um, we're part of a newly formed alliance called the Take Back Our Children Alliance. And our position, we're, we're advocates, we're lawyers, we're community members. And really our position as an alliance is that it would be a mistake to move forward with legislation that does not raise the age for all children. We as an alliance actually share the same positions behind Judge Lippman's proposal to raise the age. We also believe that brain development is an incredibly important part of the, de mm. the decision making process, that juvenile justice proceedings have great benefits, and that kids shouldn't have criminal records. So essentially share these positions with folks who are saying, Let's move forward because what's politically feasible is to raise the age for kids who have you know, much less serious charges. Then you're not actually acknowledging the fact that children's brains are not developed, that they can, you know, that they're less capable of understanding consequences, but more capable of changing their behavior than are adults. And that when you look at the report, it offers some really great examples of the fact that if we proceed with late raise the age legislation as it's outlined now, then we're basically ignoring the kids who end up with convictions. We are not raising the age because we are still treating children as adults. So I'll, I'll end there. Right. There's a lot more okay. I could say. But I'd One love more to question others. over there. Actually, I had a comment. Um, so my name is Victoria San Martino, and I run an organization called Voices Unbroken. Um, we're based in the Bronx, but we work in um, restrictive residential settings throughout the city. And so I just wanted to comment on the, the question of sustainability, because um, I know all of us are, are concerned about this. And so I just wanted to comment on the fact that a lot of the funding outside of probation, we're, I run an organization that's not funded by probation, not funded by ACS, not funded by anyone at the table. Um, and so just to say, a lot of the money's been cut from every other funding source that would otherwise fund community-based um, youth development organizations. And so I think it's important, like Ruben said, that we invest in community organizations so that they have a lot of infrastructure and so their programming is really solid. But I think just looking forward, it's also important that we look at some of the other, you know, that, that we look at um, DYCD funding, that we look at some of the other funding that right now is, is, is completely absent. So we have community centers that are closing really early um, and can't serve young people who are in the community. I mean, and then given all of the territorial issues, 
you, you know, that like that being an issue as well. But I think also just acknowledging this money that's kind of being poured into the community from, you know, and, and naming youth as juvenile justice involved youth. And if we're all really successful, which hopefully we will be, young people won't touch that system whatsoever, and there'll need to be a lot of community services so that young people can participate. Um, so I just wanted to mention right. that, because, and, and I say that as someone who's from the community and benefited tremendously from youth services that were not funded yeah, by anyone that's at the great table. Great comment. So. And I just respond to that? Uh, you know, I, I've been looking at the data lately on New York City's crime and incarceration rates, and there's been a couple of articles in the Times and the Wall Street Journal about that combine the two conversations and talk about why both crime and incarceration are going down in New York City, uh, which is not true elsewhere. Crime's going down in plenty of places, but incarceration's been a tougher nut to crack. So just since Mayor Bloomberg got, got uh, elected, uh, the rest of the country had a 6% increase in incarceration, and the city had a 32% decline, which is a big decline. For adults, this is it's even bigger for juveniles. and. If we did what the rest of the country had done during that period of time, there'd be 21,000 more people locked up from New York City, and you know, it costs of hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And I, the argument in the in the papers that I've read so far has really been risen or fallen by uh, based on police activity. And I'm sure the police have something to do with crime. I'm not going to even go there, right? Because, <laughs> but. I, what I think is neglected in the discussion is what the incredible social safety net in New York, both the general one and the one specifically focused on people who are involved in the criminal and juvenile justice systems has done, right? And, and the importance it has in that equation of both helping to reduce crime and to reduce incarceration. So the last year for which we have full year data is 2011 to 125,000 misdemeanor arrests. 680 of those people got put on probation, right? 59,000 people got a conditional discharge. I'm pretty sure what the judiciary is doing is they're sending them to you all instead of formalizing them and sending them to me. Because when you send them to me, it comes with the potential of getting incarcerated if you mess up. So, and, and, so, and I, I think that's a good thing, and I think that partially, I know, no, I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of agreeing with you on this one without, you know, I mean, uh, and that's but, uh, but I think it's, you know, it, it plays into the stuff that many of the people on the panel have talked about um, and, and is really, I think, undocumented. There's really no piece of research that says, because if you look at the, at the diversion rates in the rest of the country, they're, they're nowhere near what we're doing. There's an incredible screening mechanism in New York after people touch the system and it's screening them out to a bunch of programs that I think are helping prevent them from even being, being put on probation or being locked up and helping them make it whatever way that means. And I, I, I think part of the reason that, you know, that, that, that money doesn't flow, although in New York, I'll tell you, I've been in San Francisco and D.C. for the rest of my career. They got nothing like you guys got here. But I think part of the importance of maintaining funding for that social safety net is that it's, it's why we don't have many people locked up and still have a, a decrease in crime. I, I, I think right. it's at least part of that why. Right. An unstudied and un, undocumented part of that right. why. And, and the, the gap, I think, that still exists that Victoria is talking about is that um, right, we're, we're not sending these millions of dollars to upstate New York anymore, which is a good thing. Yep. But the dollars that we're saving are not necessarily going down to communities. Um, and there has never been, I think, in New York, the type of specific legislative mechanism that I think you've seen in places like Illinois or Ohio that have said, if you save this amount of money from incarceration, uh, a percentage of that money is going to go back to a community fund that doesn't just have to go to a juvenile justice program, but it can go to a program uh, that meets the needs of kids who are getting arrested or likely to get arrested, right? So it keeps a community center open later or it... And, and that's something that we've not accomplished. We've been able to close facilities, but the money that's saved tends to either go to fill a budget deficit gap, or again, it tends to do something that kind of reinforces system capacity, which is not overall a bad thing, but if we're gonna talk about that, and Vinny's right, the safety net is there, but the safety net is, also, is often run by people 
uh, who are doing this almost like a volunteer mission and could be doing a lot much more work in a lot stronger ways. It, again, the, the organizations that we're subcontracting, we're giving them $10,000 subgrants, and that's mostly doubling their annual budget. Mm -hmm. But the, the level of work that they do with young people for years is amazing, and that's, there needs to be a, a legislative and fiscal mechanism that actually takes those dollars saved and gets them into communities at the grassroots. Cool. I agree. So, you know, I know we ran a little over, and, and thank you all. Um, I want to say this is looking back over the last seven, eight years around juvenile justice transformation in New York. It's kind of an amazing connection between not just government agencies and staff of government agencies, but advocates and practitioners devising all of this together, sometimes in conflict, but mostly sort of moving forward, and even now we're hearing sort of these great ideas for the next phase. Yeah. So thanks to all of you for taking part. Thanks to everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you.